Hi, gang. Okay, so this is going to be my last lecture for you. Uh, it's going to be brief. Uh, I just want to cover a few topics. Sanctuary cities, just to give you some things to think about. Truth-telling, um, journalistic integrity, and jingoism. So just going to quickly cover those four topics, uh, just to, again, to give you some things to think about. But first, um, most of you have submitted your final paper. If you have not, get that to me quickly. I cannot stress that enough. Um, I have to turn in grades within 48 hours of final exam. That is a week from today. So if you owe me anything, you need to get it to me now. Get it to me quickly so that I can have your grades turned in. Here's the thing. I don't have any recourse. If I don't have it, I can't turn it in. I can't turn in a grade. Um, so that's just the way it is. Now, regarding your final quiz, your final exam, um, I sent you over the weekend, I think it was Saturday, I sent you a list of 20 terms. 15 of those will be on the final exam. Another 15 will be on the final exam that you do not know. I will select them. Don't worry. I'm not trying to trip you up. This is a quiz. You're going to be able to take your time, take it at home. I can't stop you from using resources. Uh, that being said, I know some of you are still not going to make a perfect grade on this, but uh, you have the opportunity to. So if there's anything that you owe me, get it to me, including final paper, annotated webliography. If you haven't done a presentation yet, uh, you need to get in touch with me and we need to work out a time before next Tuesday for you to do your presentation. Uh, it must be completed, uh, must be completed if you, you know, because otherwise, you know, that's a, a percentage of your grade that you're going to be missing. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, I've gone through everything that I have. Uh, if there was any late work that was submitted, uh, everything that I understand that I have, I have put a grade in Canvas. Uh, if you've sent me something and you don't have a grade for it, then you need to let me know. Uh, because as far as I know, everything I have, I did a search on your name if there was something missing. So as far as I know, you have a grade for everything. That's why I do email and not turn it in on Canvas, because Canvas goes away and I can't access it after a certain period of time. If it's in my email, I can always access it to see if it's there. So, and if you sent it. Uh, so please do. If there's anything for which you should have a grade, get it to me now. All right, so let's let's look at these uh, these four topics very quickly uh, to to talk about and give you some things to talk about. Sanctuary cities. Um, there for a while, they were definitely in in the news quite a bit. Sanctuary cities, and uh, there were people who for, were for them. There were people against them, and lots of uh, um, hype one side or the other about sanctuary cities. Well, what are they really? What are sanctuary cities actually? These are cities or counties that have uh, decided to limit their cooperation with federal immigration enforcement. That's essentially what it is. So these are cities or counties that limit their cooperation with federal immigration enforcement, also known as ICE, Immigration Custom Enforcement. Um, and it means different things in different places. Uh, there are some sanctuary cities that will not cooperate with the feds at all. Uh, there are some that, that will limit their cooperation in other ways. So it really depends. There is no single way that this is, a, is applied. I know when I, when I worked in uh, Ridgewood, New Jersey, the chief of police there said, look, we're not going to cooperate. If we pull over somebody, they don't, you know, we're not checking to see if they're citizens. Uh, however, here's the thing. If someone who is an illegal immigrant is pulled over, uh, let's just say for speeding, and um, when the police officer, deputy, whatever, state trooper, runs the license plate and the name on the, license, the person's license, they find out there's an outstanding warrant for the person. Uh, maybe they missed a court date or, or something like that. Um, whatever it might be, uh, then that person will be arrested. 
Now, if it's just a, a simple speeding violation, there's nothing on their record, outstanding, it's nothing to worry about. But if there is something outstanding on their, on their record that would cause them to be arrested, once they're taken into police custody, fingerprinted, those fingerprints go to the FBI database automatically. Uh, that, is, that happens automatically in all jurisdictions. Not only do they automatically go to the um, excuse me, FBI database, but they also go to ICE automatically. What happens then is when it goes through the FBI and goes to Immigration Custom Enforcement, uh, if, there, if that person is determined to be an illegal uh, immigrant, don't like that term necessarily, but that's often how it's, how it's used, or let's just say undocumented immigrant, then ICE will send a request for a detainer. Uh, so a detainer request. Now, uh, this is generally how sanctuary cities will work. Again, it's not the same in every place. In some places, they will disregard that request for a detainer entirely. They will say, it's not our job to hold somebody for 48 hours. In fact, it's a violation of the law for us to hold that person for 48 hours. And so the local law enforcement, once that person has been booked and uh, paid bail or whatever it is that they need to do, they will be released. Now, if they're detained for 48 hours uh, because they can't pay bail or for some reason they have to stay um, in, in custody and Immigration Customs get there in time, then they can still take them into custody at that point. But in many cases, unless it is they are known to have committed a violent felony uh, and somehow have evaded police uh, in a sanctuary city, they would be released. In fact, in many cities, whether they call themselves sanctuary cities or not, they would be released um, because, again, states aren't obligated in any way to abide by those requests. So here's where the issue comes down uh, of sanctuary cities. Let's just say that the sheriff or the uh, chief of police decides to honor that detainer request, okay? So the chief of police pulls you over, finds out that you have an outstanding warrant, you're undocumented, and so the police chief says, yep, we're going to hold that person until ICE gets here. Um, that way we won't have to deal with the person. ICE will deport them and we don't have to worry about them. Well, what happens is if you're in a place where there are a lot of immigrants, the immigrants then might be afraid to interact with and they might lose trust in the local police. So think about it. If you're in a city like New York or L.A. or, or Chicago, where there are, even around here, where there are extreme numbers of immigrants, even though most of them are here with papers and documented and, and all of those sorts of things. The danger is that perhaps that person is a brother, cousin, friend, son, of somebody who is documented and they weren't and that particular person who was arrested was not documented and now the local police have turned them over to be deported do you think those folks are going to trust the police do you think they're going to want to work with the police in the future probably not uh, the police will have squandered then that relationship that they had with the community and remember the police when 911 is called, when you call 911 and you need help, the police don't ask, um, are you a U.S. citizen? No. Their oath and their obligation is to pr protect the citizenry regardless, to protect and serve regardless. And so in that case, if immigrants don't call, the relationship then breaks down. That means that in some cases, the immigrants then become targets for crime because those who would target them 
know that they don't trust the police and will not report it. So that's the danger if they honor the request for a detainer. So let's say that the local sheriff's department says, we're not going to honor this. We're a sanctuary city. The mayor has said we're a sanctuary city. We're not going to honor these requests for detainer. Well, the problem then is that the federal and state government can withhold funding that is necessary for that police department or that sheriff's department. So funding generally comes down from two sources, the federal and the state. And so if you're in a state, if you're, if you're a, a, a municipality in, in a state like Texas, let's say, where the governor has generally decried uh, uh, sanctuary cities and said, we'll not have them here, we'll not support them. Well, the state might cut off the funds to that municipality. So then how are they going to afford to pay their police force? How are they going to afford to pay for the equipment that they need? Yeah, there might be some local taxes that help out with that, but by and large, it's not going to provide the, the, the funding stream that they need. And so it really comes down then to a question of public safety versus financial assistance. If we honor the, the immigration enforcement uh, request, the detainer request, then we risk public safety, especially for those who are in the immigrant community. If we say that we're a sanctuary city and we don't honor it, we risk losing funding from federal and or state resources. So you can see the dilemma there is genuine. You can see why it is actually a struggle and is something that we should talk about. Truth be known. Here's, here's some facts for you, and you can look these up. Uh, immigrants, uh, documented or not, commit crimes at far lower rates than uh, natural U.S. citizens. What happens usually, however, is if, if an undocumented uh, immigrant commits a crime, then very often that gets lots more of attention. Think about it with me for just a moment. Do you really think that somebody who's undocumented wants to commit a crime and call attention to themselves? Hell no. They don't want to be call attention to themselves because they know if they get caught, there's a good chance they're going to be put on trial, go to prison. When they get out of prison, they're going to be deported. So they don't want that. So uh, the truth is, um, immigrants, whether documented or not, commit crimes at a far lower rate than natural-born U.S. citizens. All right, let's move on. I said this would be this would be short, but we're already about ten minutes into this. So, truth telling. Now, we've already talked about truth telling when it comes to bioethics and business, uh, medical ethics and business. Um, well, what about truth telling in other areas of our lives? Truth-telling is more than just speaking what is true or what is right. It's also about the actions that you take. So I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a runner. So I find all kind of shit on the side of the road. Seriously, found a woman's wallet. Um, what do I do with it? I'm not going to try to hunt the person down, so dropped it off at the police department. They took all my information. I'm like, why, why are you taking my information? I'm turning it in. I didn't steal it. Um, but found a woman's wallet, turned it down. Found a credit card. Credit card. Boy, I don't know what I could have bought with it, but found a credit card. Took it back to the bank that issued the credit card. Found a box of business cards from somebody who worked for the, for the um, uh, federal government one time. Uh, not sure what I would have done with those, but... Call the number on the credit. Uh, call the number on the business card and uh, turn those back in. Um, most interesting one is I found a cell phone out for a run one day, and uh, it was on the side of the highway, uh, 202 of all places. Uh, cell phone on the on the side of the highway. 
So I took it home and like, what am I going to do with this? Do I, do I turn this in somewhere? What do I do? Because if you know, uh, there's no way to unlock it uh, to find out who it belongs to or anything like that. So I decided, you know what, I'll just hold on to it for a little while and see if it rings. And if it rings, then maybe I'll say, I don't know who you're trying to call, but I have their phone. And I'd like to give it back to them. Sure enough, I've been home for about 10 minutes. Uh, the phone rings. I'm like, duh, okay, shit. I answer the phone. Uh, turns out it's the woman's son. Uh, he's a police officer. And, um, and I said, look, I found the phone when I was out for a run. If you want it, here's my address. I'll leave it on the front porch. You come pick it up. Um, he thanked me profusely for that. It was his mother's phone. She had left it on the top of her, on the roof of her car when she was driving off. Excuse me. And it blew off, of course, and I found it. He left me 20 bucks. I didn't ask for that. Didn't want that. But, you know, put some, put some fuel in my car or something. I don't, I don't know. So all of that, truth telling is not just about what you say. When we talk about truth telling, we talked about it in relation to uh, medical ethics. We talked about it in relation to business. But what about in other areas of our lives? If we apply some of the ethical uh, methods and ethical uh, structures that, that we talked about early in the semester, we have to ask about truth telling and whether or not uh, we are truthful people. And the people with whom we interact, we would like to ask, are they truthful people also? So what is the importance of truth-telling when it comes to politics? Can you trust what a politician says to you? I know you say all politicians lie. Well, they've actually done studies, uh, and they find that some politicians lie a, a lot less than others. Um, if you trust uh, the Washington Post, uh, you might find that the current president of the United States in three and a half years is on record with something like 15,000, 16,000 lies in three and a half years. Now, if you don't trust the Washington Post, I don't know what source you would look at to find out about that. Um, but I do remember, for example, when Barack Obama was pushing uh, for the Affordable Health Care Act, um, the Af Affordable Care Act, I'm sorry, uh, the ACA, also known as Obamacare, uh, he had said, well, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. And a small number of people did not get to keep their doctor when they went on this plan. Now, if you were in a plan that you could keep, you could have kept your doctor. But if you elected to go off of that plan or for some reason had to go off of that plan and you went on to the public option, then you might not have been able to keep your doctor. Um, so was that a lie or was it not? Um, I don't know. Uh, that's for you to decide. I'm not here to, to, to judge politics for you but it is something to think about. What about your taxes? I, know, I don't know if you even do your own taxes. Uh, this year, for the first time, my wife and I did our taxes. I usually have an accountant do ours, but this year, for the first time, we did ours. We agonized, not because we were trying to find a way to not claim things or not do things, because we were afraid that there were some things that we should do that, that weren't being done correctly or that weren't, weren't being done right. Um, unfortunately, we were we were we felt pretty good about it when they were all done, and uh, our taxes were accepted, and there were no apparently no errors in them, at least as far as we know as of right now. But here's a bigger area of truth telling to consider in your relationships with your spouse, your partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe even your parents. What is the role of truth telling there? What obligation to tell the truth do you have? Is there ever an occasion when telling the truth would be harmful to, for the other person? And in those cases, should you lie or say nothing? Um, if you're ever a member of a support group, uh, especially a 12-step, you'll know that one of the 12 steps um, made direct amends except when to do so would hinder um, the person to whom you're making the amends or others. So there are some times when telling the truth might not be 
the best policy. But does that mean that it's okay to lie? Um, or does it mean that there might be another time when telling the truth would be preferable? Um, I don't have the answer for that for you. Uh, you. That's something you need to think about uh, for your own personal moral code. Uh, and that's something I, I encourage you to really think about, uh, your own personal uh, moral code. You know, it's said that we live in a post-truth era. Um, I don't know. I try to be honest myself. Um, you know, that's, that's a decision that you have to make. All right. The third category that I want to talk about in this is journalistic integrity. Um, how do I put this um, delicately but bluntly? Um, some sources of, of, of journalism, some uh, sources of, of news are more reliable and honest than others. Uh, let's just, you know, call a spade a spade. There's some... Um, sources of news that are just not really good. Um, I, 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 will, I will tell you the truth. My favorite source of news is uh, NPR, National Public Radio, on WNYC or out of Philly, WHYY. Uh, that's what I listen to most of the time. Uh, I do tune in. Um, I occasionally tune in to Fox because I want to know what they're saying, but I take it all with a grain of salt. I don't really trust them. I tune in to MSNBC because I want to know what they're saying, but I don't always trust what it is. I, I, I find them to go on rants uh, that are not really helpful. Um, I do like a couple of the, the, uh, the uh, commentators that they have there that I do find very trustworthy. Uh, John Meacham is, is one in particular that I find, I, I just, uh, I, I've, I've actually met him and I know a little bit about him, so I, I do find him uh, to be trustworthy. But the fact of the matter is, um, if, if you look at a lot of sources, they are skewed in one way or another toward one biased opinion or another. And so we have to be careful then where we get our news and how we are informing and educating ourselves about the affairs of, of every day. Uh, Noam Chomsky um, has, has also written about that, uh, the five filters of media of which we need to be aware. And uh, Chomsky uh, actually, in, in listing these, he said number one is uh, most media outlets are corporate owned. So they're owned by a big corporation. Uh, and that means that their motive is one thing, profit. So in everything that they do, they are out to generate income for the company. And so when there is a profit motive to media, uh, you have to then ask questions about, are they really telling us what it is that we need to know? That, that's actually why, you know, something like NPR, uh, National Public Radio, because they're funded by people, not so much by tax dollars. They're mostly funded by donations. But still, even then, uh, you do have to wonder sometimes. You do have to ask questions. But what I find is that NPR and, and those public sources like that will often say, uh, if they're doing a story on, 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 on one of their supporters, they will say, uh, such and such is a supporter of, excuse me, NPR. So that is something that, you know, you have to keep in mind as well. Generally speaking, uh, well, no, let me go into the second point. Uh, the second uh, filter for the media uh, beyond corporate ownership and profit is advertising. Um, so just reporting the news in and of itself does not pay the bills. It just doesn't. Uh, in fact, they need big, big sporting events sometimes to pay parts of the bills. That's why, you know, that, you know, companies will pay multi-million dollars for an ad on the Super Bowl uh, and other big events. They'll, they'll pay millions of dollars for an ad just for a 30 second ad. I actually did an ad campaign one time. The amount of money that's required um, to, to 
put in advertising to get something out there is 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 absolutely just staggering. Um, but um, it, it is a reality. Uh, so when you're talking about advertising, uh, the advertising is necessary to fund the reporters. And what is it that the newspaper or the television news is going to deliver? They're going to deliver readers or watchers. Uh, and so then there is this symbiotic relationship between advertising and the news. Now, this is what I was about to say a moment ago before I got to the second. Ideally, there is a wall. Uh, and they, if, you, if you deal with some of the big, um, big newspaper firms or anything like that, they will talk about a wall of separation uh, between advertising and the news section. So a wall between the advertising portion of the business and the news collecting portion of the business. I've known a number of reporters uh, throughout my, my career. I've also known a few people who work in the advertising marketing section of, of, of like the New York Times. And so ideally those two areas do not interact and talk about their business with each other. Um, but you would be naive to think that the reporters are not aware of some of the advertisers just like the advertisers would be aware of some of the big name reporters. And so that would be why they would want to advertise in that paper because they know they'll get eyes. And the reason some of the reporters will look and see uh, who the big advertisers are, will they pull their punches if they have a story that might affect an advertiser. Number three, the filter of the media is the establishment. Uh, the establishment, the man, if you will manages the media. So the man manages the media by providing uh, inside sources or scoops. Um, excuse me. So uh, reporters have to build relationships with people in areas of politics. Uh, and so um, uh, if you build a relationship with someone, you might go to them and say, tell me what's really going on. And of course, they might say, you have to keep my name out of it. Or this is what I want you to know. Uh, it is it has been reported pretty widely that when people in the current uh, presidential administration, uh, when the president will not listen to them, that one of the ways that they can get his attention is that they'll go to the media and they'll, they'll put out a story in the media that the president then will look at and say, what's up with this? Why, why are they saying this? And then he will open a dialogue or open a conversation uh, with some in his administration. The problem with that, and this is the fourth uh, filter for the media, is the flack. Uh, so the flack. So if uh, a reporter puts out a story for example, that the president doesn't like, the president might say, I'm not giving you access anymore. Whereas the president will give access to those who favorably report on him. Perfect example. Uh, I don't think the current president has sat down even once with CNN because he doesn't trust CNN. I don't think he sat down once with the Washington Post. He did at one point, I think, sit down with the New York Times. Um, I don't even know if he's been with ABC or NBC uh, in his three and a half years. But he has multiple times appeared on Fox. He sees Fox as generally being favorable to him. And so there he can manage the media. Whereas on the other side, uh, he finds the reporting that comes out of some other sources uh, disfavorable to him, and therefore that's the flack. So he will not talk to them, talk to those sources. All right, the fifth filter for the media, and that's the need for a common enemy. So right now we have an obvious uh, common enemy, and that's COVID-19. It's on every, every news outlet that you turn on. Uh, that is our common enemy. And so the media, then they will hype the common enemy because they know that that gets eyes and readers. 
So they will keep telling us stories and nuances and breaking news because they want to hold your attention because the longer they hold your attention, the more advertising money they rake in. Now, for a time, the common enemy was terrorism, especially back in the early part of this uh, in, of the 2000s. It was terrorism. And there was a damn terrorist under every rock, behind every door. Uh, and so we were made to be fearful of these terrorists that were all over the place. And before that, at a time, it was communism. Communism here. Every time you lifted up a rock, you would find a communist and so the media would report on that. And of course, they wanted to keep our attention on that. So the five filters of media then would be corporate ownership or profit, advertising, uh, how the establishment manages the media, the flack that they get, and the need for a common enemy. All right, let's turn our attention then. We're 30 minutes into this, so let's turn our attention now to the final Final topic is jingoism. I don't know if you've heard that term before, uh, but I wanted to put it out there as a topic. I wish we could, we were in class to discuss this because there's lots of clips I'd love to show you. Um, but jingoism, basically, you would describe it as extreme patriotism or uh, being blindly patriotic, excessively nationalistic. Um, Jingoism is designed in some ways to hurt or uh, uh, damage other countries um, for the purpose of building up your country. Uh, so you build up your country even as you try to tear down, damage, or hurt another country. And the way that that sometimes happens is through extreme economic sanctions on other countries or with a continual threat of force against other countries. And that would be using economic sanctions or threats of force rather than going through the diplomatic channels. Uh, diplomacy is an art. And any military person worth their salt will tell you they would rather have a hundred uh, diplomats rather than a hundred tanks. Uh, because if you have a hundred tanks, you're going to be inclined to use them. It's the old the old adage, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and so the military would much rather have diplomats to solve problems rather than go to war to solve problems. Um, and so that's where uh, extreme economic sanctions and threats of force often come in rather than diplomacy. That leads to jingoism or, or excessive nationalism, extreme patriotism or blind patriotism. Um, it, it sometimes takes um, uh, language you'll, you'll hear uh, is things like, we're the best, we're number one, at what? Everything. We're the most powerful. Um, or it might take the language of, if you oppose our country, um, you must be defeated. Uh, President George W. Bush famously said, this was after a year or two after September 11th. He said, uh, if you're not for us, you're against us. Well, that's not necessarily the case uh, in the real world. Uh, I know at that time, uh, it was during uh, George W. Bush's uh, time in office that, that I traveled to Southeast Asia. And uh, it was not the case at all. Uh, there were some countries that just didn't want to deal with us at that time. Uh, because of some of the uh, positions that we had taken. They weren't really against us. They just didn't want to have much to do with us. Um, but yet we held such sway over them uh, through uh, economic uh, means and things like that. Other ways that you'll hear uh, jingoistic attitudes put forth is, um, this is America. Love it or leave it. Well, that's not how it works. Uh, one of the joys of being an American citizen is you can speak out, you can even hate your own country, and you don't have to leave it. That's why we have the freedoms we do. Or um, speak English. Uh, I remember hearing a wonderful story one time. Uh, a woman was, was in line uh, at, a, at, a, at some type of uh, store, a retail store, and she was on her cell phone talking 
uh, to someone and, the, and, and a person in line in front of her turned around and, and said to her, look, you know, if you can't speak, speak English, you don't need to be here. And the woman put down her phone and said uh, something to the effect of, I was speaking Navajo. We were here first. You go home. Um, so jingoism takes on all of those extremes. So we could ask questions then about uh, what, what are the dangers of uh, thinking about uh, America being so exceptional? Are there dangers to that? What message uh, do you send when you, uh, you know, fly an American flag off the back of your car? Uh, just a pet peeve right there, just to tell you. Uh, I have problems with that uh, because flags should not be tattered. And if you fly a flag off of your truck or your car, it's going to get tattered. And uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the uniform code to deal with to how to handle flags, they should never be torn or tattered. Um, and so uh, one of the other things, as a runner, here's another thing that I find. Oftentimes I see American flags on the side of the road. Sometimes I'll pick them up and take them uh, so that they can be retired appropriately and with, with respect. So, you know, I question sometimes uh, people's motives when they do that. And it makes me wonder if it's jingoistic um, uh, in return. You see them on, on overpasses too, and they get dingy, they get torn, they get ripped. Uh, it's really disgraceful to treat the flag that way. If you really respect it, um, why would you allow it to be treated that way? At the same time, yeah, if you want to make a public statement, if you want to, if you want to protest, burn a flag, I have no problem with that. Yeah. Um, so, all right, folks, um, this is going to wrap up my lecture. I don't know how many of you are actually going to watch this. I hope uh, all of you will at least, at least turn in, tune in for a few minutes of this. Uh, it's been a great semester. It's been a hard semester. I know for many of you, it's been a hard semester for me to make the adjustment. Uh, I hope, I hope I haven't let you down with that. Um, I think there's somehow to do, to do a, um, um, uh, what do you, what do you call it? Where you give a review. Um, I, I don't even know if they're actually doing those this semester, but I, I think there is. Uh, if you have time, please do take, take a chance to do that. Take the opportunity to do that. Uh, when I had you in class, I enjoyed it. I look forward to reading your papers. I've started on some of them, but I look forward to doing that. Please, if you owe me anything, any, any work, please get it to me. Please, please, please get it to me so that I can turn, turn it in. Um, I'd really, uh, my goal is to help you pass this class. Uh, I don't want to see you not. All right, gang. Thanks so much. Um, see you around.